Welcome to the College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. Here's Shahan J. Haraja and Bobek Hayeri. Hey, everybody, it's College Football Survivor Show. I'm Bob Ekayeri with my fantastic co host, Jahan Jay Araja, national college football writer for CBS Sports. Today, we're going to be taking a look at some of the notable spring games coming up this week, you know, marquee games like Alabama, Georgia, and of course, Ohio State, as well as several of the others we thought are worth taking a look at. But before we dive in, let me remind you that you can find us on X and TikTok at CFB Survivor Show, where we have video highlights of the show, run polls, and listen to your feedback. Take a moment, if you can, to like, rate, and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast. We value that a lot. So we at the College Football Survivor Show, we look at, during the season, the race to be the ultimate college football playoff champion. So we're going to focus, I think, a little bit more on the spring games involving those teams. So while we do know that the Akron Zips annual blue and white spring game is on Saturday, April 27th at 3 p.m. Eastern, we will not be breaking that one down. But there are some big ones this weekend. And I know before we started this one, Shahan, you were telling me you thought the the real contenders are are actually just this Saturday. And I, I thought they, I think there's still a few more. Um, coming up, but I mean, the the bulk of them do seem to be coming up this weekend. Yeah, well, you know, maybe maybe the next weekend you can throw like maybe Texas into the group, like Notre Dame into the group. But I think that when you're talking about the most interesting teams in the country, the vast majority of them are going to be playing spring games this week. Uh, of course, I think the top two, and I, I made reference to it earlier, but uh, I have a piece going up on cbsports.com in the next day or two, breaking down some of what faces Ohio State and Georgia. But these are the two programs that this offseason, I think that everybody should be paying attention to. You know, to start with Ohio State, Obviously, what they've done in the transfer portal, adding Caleb Downs as a safety, adding multiple quarterbacks into that room to replace Kyle McCord. Uh, they bring in Jeremiah Smith, a really exciting wide receiver. We had the Cam Coleman conversation on on uh, Tuesday's show. Now we have a chance, I think, to talk about Jeremiah Smith. Uh, this is a team that also retained a lot from last year, especially on the defensive side of the ball. JT Tuimoloau coming back, Jack Sawyer coming back, players who we didn't expect to be back are, are going to be back on that defense. So this is more than any other program in America, I'd make the case a make or break year for Ohio state. I'm not saying they have to win the national championship, but in a 12 team playoff, I think they have to make the national championship game. And Outside of Ohio State, I, I think you also have to look at Georgia. Georgia, for the first time since 2007 or something like that, returns the best quarterback in America. And that is a crazy thing to say about a program that is a defense first program. Uh, I, I think ultimately, you know, they're in a position right now with Carson Beck where offensively you just expect this thing to keep rolling and you expect it to keep growing. Uh, the offense did take a slight step back in some ways after losing Todd Monk into the NFL, but talent wise, they should be up there with anybody in the country. And defensively, we know what they are. So when you're looking this upcoming weekend, I, I think Ohio State and Georgia have to be the headliners. You know, one thing, um, and we've talked about this in, in prior shows, as we kind of look at these spring games, we know that you take everything with a bit of a grain of salt. You know, a player who might be a superstar on spring game day may end up being nothing, uh, or at least being not quite able to, to emerge when it comes to, to fall competition. And another aspect is also there's some strategy to um, protecting players that might be uh, uh, guaranteed starters, like sometimes a running back. Like you, how many times do you really want to have a running back play when the wear and tear on them is is a little more risky than than some of the other players? And and for creativity in particular, sometimes coaches have been known to hide some of the really interesting plays or or theory or strategies they're looking at, and that comes into play particularly um, with Ohio State. There, I mean, it's going to be on Fox uh, Network, which is going to be something else for a spring game. But at the same time. Chip Kelly's only fairly recently got there. I don't know for all the excitement of how the Ohio State offense is going to look with Ryan Day handing off play calling duties to someone he used to who he's a long history with and trusts um, very closely. I'm not sure if the the viewing public is going to see exactly how Ohio State. We might see glimpses of it, but also there's so much going on there too. I mean, 
It's really fun. I was kind of looking at their roster, especially the transfers, all these star transfers. I think Caleb Downs is the safest, like, plug and play. There's no doubt it's going to be him. I mean, even with Quinshawn Judkins, I mean, we're, we're e- expecting kind of um, some sort of balance with him and obviously a star like Travion Henderson. Those are two guys that are absolutely capable of being a feature back. And, and Chip Kelly certainly likes to, to use a run game quite a bit in his offense. But the quarterback battle is going to be fun to see. Um, Will Howard, of course, is the presumed starter, but we've got, you know, apparently reps being given to Devin Brown, uh, Lincoln Kleinholtz, and, and Julian Sayan. I mean, I think only Aaron Nolan, who's obviously just coming in, is kind of getting a little bit of a back burner, which is understandable given that room. But, I mean, it's fascinating to see how this is all going to work out and what we're going to see. I mean, we're going to probably see Jeremiah Smith. I think everyone wants to see him. And it's funny also, just kind of going what you're saying, Cam Coleman – amazed everybody at Auburn spring game. Well, now let's see the guy who was ranked ahead of him. Let's see, you know, are, are we going to see unfair comparisons to Marvin Harrison Jr.? I mean, but at the same time, they're bringing back, obviously, like Buka, Carnell Tate. They've got they've got talent there. And then and at tight end, I mean, who's going to step up for Cade Stover's uh, absent spot? They've got a couple of good guys on the roster already. They've got a good transfer from Ohio. Um, there's a lot of exciting things to see. But again, uh, I temper that with with the things I mentioned before and, and how creative they're going to get. But the defense will certainly be strong for sure. I mean, but going back to that, I mean, am I wrong to think that that we shouldn't expect that much from Chip Kelly's offense this this spring game? Well, I think that when we're watching Ohio State uh, play in their spring game this weekend, it's going to be not just who they have offensively, but how they do things offensively. And you mentioned Chip Kelly coming in. Chip Kelly has been a power run type coach over the past couple of years at UCLA. He's really diversified the running game. The idea of the the sort of fast pace, you know, getting guys in space, that's not really what he's prioritized during his time at UCLA. And now uh, you add a player like Quinshawn Judkins, who is less of a burner than sort of a physical all-purpose back. I think that that only maximizes what Chip Kelly's able to do. And the other thing that I think that you have to mention is you want to see how they're calling their passing offense in this game. Now, look, it's vanilla. You don't expect them to come through and uh, and suddenly be reigning the most diversified passing schemes that you've ever seen. But by bringing Will Howard, a, a player who has been more of an intermediate passer than a deep passer during his time at Kansas State, I'm fascinated to see how they call the game for him because I think a big part of the projection with Will Howard when he was recruited by both USC and Ohio State this offseason is, you know, he is somebody who could be asked to do more, who could potentially, you know, lean more on his arm strength, go downfield a little bit more, obviously make good decisions. I'm going to be interested to see in this game do they call the game safe for him or do they ask him to try some stuff? Do they say, you know, we want you to try to throw the 40 yard bomb just to see if you can do it again. We'll do it on a vanilla route. We're not going to do anything crazy schematically, but do we trust you to go down the field a little bit or are most of your pass attempts within 10 to 15 yards of the line of scrimmage? There's advantages and disadvantages to both. I mean, you look last year, And obviously Michigan and their national championship team is going to be the standard to which Ohio State as a program is held this upcoming season. But they didn't ask their quarterback to have to go downfield all that much. Now, J.J. McCarthy, I think, had proven that he could if he needed to. But it was something that they maybe did five times all season instead of with Ohio State. You're talking about them doing it 10 times per game. What kind of strategy do they go with? for a passing offense with Will Howard in the lineup. And the other piece, too, is when you do have all these other quarterbacks, like you mentioned, come through, you have uh, Devin Brown, of course, who returned from last season. You have Julian Sayan, the transfer from Alabama. You have Aaron Nolan, the exciting freshman. You have Lincoln Kineholtz. You've got five different quarterbacks who all play just a little bit differently. What direction do they kind of go with with all these players? Do they kind of keep things the same no matter who's in the lineup or do they change up the passing game quite a bit in terms of what they call whenever a different quarterbacks in the lineup absolutely and we're also going to see i mean one one of the less i guess glamorous parts of a spring game is we'll also see them kind of finish out the offensive line kind of rotate some guys in and out they have some guys that are returning the right side's going to need a little bit of work i know they've got luke montgomery who's been getting a lot of looks he's a young guy um, who's been getting uh, first-team offensive reps. And then the center battle, because, I mean, Seth McLaughlin isn't a foregone conclusion, but the Alabama transfer is there. 
But they have someone else there as well in Carson Hinsman, and we'll see who starts to, to see to see the ball more. I mean, but I agree. It'll be fun to see the full creativity of, of the Chip Kelly offense unleashed again. Well, maybe a few games. I think the first game is Akron. Um, so again, Akron may also see a vanilla Ohio State offense um, unless things really go go south. But um, it's an exciting program. I can't wait to see. Uh, and by the way, I have to say, we this is just going back to a little conversation we had in the last show. Um, as I was going over some of the players and some of the names, you know, I was looking at, obviously, uh, I always forget James Laurinaitis has come back to Ohio State to be their uh, a linebacker coach. But in my mind, I'm thinking the high school grad from just down the street from where I live now, who, again, lost from Minnesota, never had a chance at him and he went to Ohio State to become a superstar. So one more of that that pattern that I'm now seeing, it's like opened my eyes to all of these these Minnesota greats who who go on to have great, great successful careers at other colleges. Um, you know, but going to Georgia as well, you know, I think Georgia is just, as you kind of alluded to, there's so much talent returning there, even with some of the big losses. And I mean, the secondary seems to be the area of biggest concern because, you know, you lose, uh, you know, Bullard, you lose uh, Lassiter, you lose Tyke Smith. Um, who's going to step up, do you think? Or or should we, what is your, what are your thoughts on the rebuilding of the secondary of, of Georgia? Yeah, well, one thing that I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago was, of course, they have some exciting freshmen coming in that have a chance to compete. Uh, once again, the number one recruiting class like Georgia has continued to do over the years. But two early enrollees in the secondary to keep an eye on are Ellis Robinson, who was the number two overall player in the top two four seven, a six foot one cornerback. And K.J. Bolden, uh, the number 15 overall player, is six foot one safety from actually from Buford, Georgia, right down the road from Athens. So. You know, these are two players who I think are going to fight for playing time. I think that Bolden as a safety probably has a slight edge up. And the other piece you have to mention, too, is that Malachi Starks, their star starting safety, has been out for the spring. Of course, he'll be back for the fall, will be totally fine, and will be a starting player for them. But it does give K.J. Bolden an opportunity to push his way into the lineup, to have a chance to uh, to get some key reps in practice, not just second team reps, but first team reps potentially at times. So I, I think that that recruiting class, you have to be excited about that. And, you know, when you look at the recruiting class in general, they had a heavy round of early enrollees who were defensive backs. You know, I mentioned Ellis Robinson and KJ Bolding, but even going down the list to Mello Jones was a top 75 national recruit to Andre Evans, a top 110 national recruit. So they do have an exciting young room. Again, a lot of those guys that I mentioned are more on the corner side than the safety side. I'll be kind of curious to see if all those players end up at uh, at cornerback at Georgia or wh whether any of these guys are able to, you know, you mentioned Tyke Smith leading, you know, he played more of a nickel role where he played over the slot. Do they potentially find some reps for some of these guys to get into that kind of lineup? So there's a lot of names. And again, none of this even gets into some of the returners that they have. They, they have a lot of really good players coming back as well. One of the, the biggest things that you have to say about them is they've done a great job of developing and getting guys on the field. They rotate players as much as anybody in the country because they have more talented players than everybody in the country <laughs> right now. But that's been a huge example for them, right? Julian Humphrey is a player coming up who I think is definitely going to factor into the starting lineup. Uh, you know, as a returner, Daniel Harris, uh, as a returner, Ja'Cory Thomas, they've got a lot of guys who I think will be pushing for playing time. And I'll be kind of curious to see who comes out of the lineup. You know, on the other side of the ball, obviously Carson Beck is exceptional, as you pointed out. So he's returning. Um, he's got a new sick new ride, which I have no, I'm not casting no shade on that. Good for him for getting that, for being so patient. But um, they also lose, though, a lot. He's going to have a lot of new targets because obviously they lose Brock Bowers. They lose Ladd McConkey and Marcus uh, Rosemey's uh, Jack Saint. And then they they surprise lost one of Brock Bowers' presumed replacements. Um, uh, Pierce Sperlin, who is the number two ranked tight end in their 2023 class, um, he was medically disqualified due to a congenital heart defect, which that's a serious business. I mean, yeah, I, I, you know, for his sake, I mean, I again, that's frankly why we have NIL. Um, I'm glad we have NIL because these things happen. And, you know, I, I hope he gets something out of out of this college career. But so you're look, you were now looking at obviously a, still there's a lot of talent back there. You have um, Dominic Lovett, uh, Dylan Bell, 
uh, Rara Thomas uh, and the wide receivers. You have uh, Oscar Delp and Lawson Lockie for the tight ends. But then they also have some good transfers coming in with London Humphreys from Vanderbilt, uh, Colby Young from Miami. They've got a really promising senior transfer from Stanford, although he hasn't practiced. Uh, he hasn't been available for the spring in uh, Benjamin Urosik, um, who was an old Pac-12 guy. And they even have, um, well, a banged up senior from USC, Michael Jackson III. So it'll be interesting to see. There's a lot of potential talent that I just named there. Who's going to be the targets? Who? How are they going to be implementing this offense? And, and who Beck seems to kind of click with, you know? Um, as much as anything, I'm I'm really looking forward to that, and I think it's going to be an interesting part of of things to look for for dogs fans out there. And I think another player that you didn't even mention, who of course uh, is going to contribute in the passing game as well, is Trevor Etienne transferring in at running back. They haven't had a great running back for a little while at this point. Of course, George used to be running back you in so many ways, but they've played more of a rotation of guys. Over the past couple of years where, you know, maybe three different guys are getting major carries. I still think that they're not going to overload Trevor Etienne by any means. But the fact that they have a player that I think can be relied on over and over and over again to get, uh, you know, a few yards here or there or potentially catch balls out of the backfield. I I think that that's a huge deal for this program. It certainly has to hurt that for the University of Florida, maybe a program we can get to in a second, that he's their best player and he went to one of their top rivals. But I I think that this is as talented a running back as they've had come through there. But no, and ultimately, I think that uh, you look at Georgia's running back rotation as well. They still have a lot of talented players who are going to be back in uh, in 2024. You know, Roderick Robertson had had a great uh, freshman season for Georgia last year, average eight yards per carry. So to have multiple players who can factor into that lineup and uh, make their job easy is going to be huge. Now, an aspect that I don't think we'll get a lot of information from uh, in the spring game is they do turn over a little bit of the offensive line uh, right now Am- Amaris Mims is was probably their top lineman last year and he didn't really play like he was out for a lot of the year they managed to maintain but you look at their title teams offensive line has been one of their top overall position groups the the question is going to be you know can they continue to grow at that position where they not only are able to be good at that position but once again be sort of a top end top five in the country type elite position on that group but i'll tell you what if if their offensive line gets back to business and their defensive backs are able to rotate some guys in i mean what where do you attack this team what what do you do to play a team like this because i've made the case before on this podcast i think the 2021 georgia team was a defense first team it was maybe one of the greatest defenses in the history of football I made the case that 2022 was an offensive team, right? Right. It was Stetson Bennett. It was going down the field. It was, and they were good defensively, but they were not as elite as they were the year before. I mean, in 2024, it's not inconceivable that they could have both of these aspects functioning at the highest level that we've ever seen them at the same time. Oh, the Georgia Death Star will be fully operational. (laughs) You know, um, kind of rounding out the, the, I would say the marquee games coming up this this weekend. And I think maybe perhaps this, this next team is grandfathering in a little bit based on the talent of the, the outgoing administration, but you know, lots of teams have won a national championship with a first year head coach coming back to a talent led in team, even if the head coach is good or not, but we're going to assume uh, they are Alabama. It's a big deal. First spring game without Nick Saban in ages. Welcome Kalen DeBoer and friends. You got a whole new staff. Um, obviously Ryan Grubb uh, was replaced with Nick Sheridan pretty early on. So he's had a chance to be that offensive coordinator. You've got former head coaches, Kane Womack and Mo Linguist who ditched their G five positions to, to coach that defense. Um, and I mean, the marquee of it all right now, uh, it, it's hard not to ignore Jalen Milrow and, and how he's going to develop under, uh, DeBoer and, and obviously Nick Sheridan's offense. Cause last season was fascinating to watch him grow. Um, once they kind of sorted out who the starting quarterback was going to be and watch him blossom into somebody who wasn't a Heisman finalist, but was awfully close to being one in a lot of people's minds. So Ty Simpson is actually impressed apparently as well in practice and seems to be the likely QB number two, but they also have a promising transfer coming in with Austin Mack um, coming again from, from DeBoer's former team. What other areas are you looking at for Alabama? 
Well, I think that it's going back to those big picture structure things, right? I mean, one of the most exciting things about Kalen DeBoer taking over this Alabama program is Jalen Miller is going to get to work with a QB guru in Kalen DeBoer. He's going to be all around Milro, I think, during some of those early practices. And I expect that he's going to get the most out of Jill and Milro, whether it is as a passer or whether it is just as an overall football player. I've made the case before. I think that Jalen Milro's first season reminded me in a lot of ways of Jalen Hurts early in his Alabama tenure. Now, I think that Milro was a third year player at that point. Uh, Jalen Hurts is obviously a first year player. But as a passer, you see the tools and it's just kind of the consistency that had been really difficult. Well, now for Alabama coming in, I mean, you've got potentially some really, really good players uh, around him. And I think that you've got a staff that maybe will be able to even more than Nick Saban's staff get the most out of him. Now, one player that I wish was going to be playing in the spring game who won't be is Ryan Williams, the top 10 player, number three overall wide receiver uh, in the class of 2024. He didn't enroll early. He's going to be coming in the summer, but I expect that he's going to be a player who immediately factors into the lineup, replaces Isaiah Bond, has a chance to be one of the more special wide receivers that Alabama has had uh, maybe since Devontae Smith or Jameson uh, Williams, potentially. So, you know, offensively, I'm, I'm more interested in the structure of everything. I'm more interested in how does it look? How comfortable does it look? Does it look like it, uh, you, you know, do they continue to to kind of keep the ball downfield like they did, obviously, when they were at Washington with Michael Penix Jr.? Or is it more of a we're going to take what's their kind of attack, which certainly has merits on its own? And then defensively, similar sort of deal. I, I just want to see... How do they approach things? Because, you know, Alabama's defense, of course, you lose a Caleb Downs. That's a that's a big deal. Dallas Turner was off to the NFL. Chris Braswell is gone. They have a lot of position battles potentially on that defense. And I've said before, too, like Kalen DeBoer, for whatever you want to say about this Alabama team and whatever they lost, this is easily the most talented team that Kalen DeBoer has ever had the opportunity to coach. And he just coached in a national championship game. So I'm going to be kind of curious to see, do they... Do they come in and say, we are going to try to be a lockdown type defense from year one, like Nick Saban kind of uh, the way that Nick Saban approached it? Or are they more of how they approach their Washington team where we want to be disruptive, we want to get stops, we want to turn the ball over? Uh, that's going to be a hard thing to maybe learn in totality from a spring game, but it's what I want to see. Absolutely. You know, kind of looking at some of the other positions that are out there, one, a couple of the other things that, that caught my eye was running back, only because they, they obviously lost Jace McClellan to the NFL. They lost Rayel Williams to Florida State. So you've got some interesting candidates. You've got Jam Miller, Justice Haynes, who, who played a little bit last year. You have Rich Richard Young, who sounds like he needs a little bit more of development. And then you have Daniel Hill, a true freshman coming in with a lot of promise and versatility. I mean, it's not like Kalen DeBoer doesn't use a running back. So um, I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing who develops there. And then uh, the offensive line has, has there's kind of an interesting thing that's been quietly developing there. And it's, it's at center because obviously they lost Seth uh, McLaughlin, who we've talked about, who's now at Ohio State. Um, at first, it seemed like they had a, a legit replacement with Parker Brailsford coming from Washington, coming from that Joe, Joe Moore award winning uh, offensive line, but he's apparently, and they're not being clear. He's been absent for something that isn't potentially, to, hopefully nothing too serious, but they're saying he's dealing with personal issues. And that's what the coaches keep saying. So he hasn't been practicing with the team. Therefore, um, James Brockermeyer has been stepping up as the center, at least in practice. And I assume we'll see him on Saturday. And then of course there's, there's been battles for the tackle spots, um, there seem to be some folks who who be st who are stepping up so far in practice that we're hearing will be interesting to see. And then, of course, Caden Proctor is going to eventually return to the team um, after leaving to Iowa for a hot minute. So um, we'll see how he eventually works back into it. And one other position that I think always gets missed because there's not enough respect on special teams in, in the college football universe. Will Reichert was a phenomenal kicker and at Alabama. For those of us of a certain vintage, know how big of a deal that is to have at Alabama. So. It'll be really interesting to see. Um, I believe it's Connor Talty, who was the number two place kicker out of Chicago, coming down to Alabama. Um, he's got a big kicking shoe to fill uh, right there. Uh, and, and that is something, especially if Alabama getting used to a new coaching staff, maybe a couple of shaky games that people don't expect. You need that kicker a lot of times to kind of bail you out. That'll be interesting. I mean, maybe not as much as was it 
was it Auburn's spring game where they had like five field goals? You might not need to quite go that far, but um, we'll see how that kind of turns out as well. It's it's interesting to see that. I mean, I'm, there's so many mystery quests, mis- mysterious aspects to to this new Alabama program only because of of this this break with with consistency that you had under the Nick Saban regime. I have to pause this for a second because we just got some bizarre news across the timeline. Uh, Beer Alexander, who was reported to be transferring from USC just on uh, on Tuesday, just said, I'm not crystal clear on all the noise or what any of this portal mess is about. I'm here to finish what I started, and that's chasing a natty here at USC with my teammates <laughs> fight on. So the Batman came through. The Batman came say, through. That, that to me sounds like a – like, does he – is he using James Franklin's agent or something? Like, how, how do you do <laughs> – Did he get a 1075? Did he get a full Jimbo uh, to come back? I, I, I honestly thought he was gone because I saw that message also on – it was like Tuesday or Monday. I, did, I just saw it. I'm like, yep, yeah. all right, well – <laughs> Thanks again, uh, Alex Grinch, for your lasting legacy. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but my goodness, yeah, because I was also shocked that he was leaving, only because like you literally have an entirely new staff, and on paper, yeah. the new USC defensive staff looks awfully great. Um, and I was thinking, like, is there some issue? But yeah, there you go. Uh, do, do you know the last time that Bear Alexander played for the same football team two years in a row? Was it high school? No, it was it was when he was in middle school in Terrell, Texas. That's the last time he played. It, well, he didn't actually play. He enrolled at five high schools in four years and then, of course, played a year at Georgia, played a year at USC. So it would have been his eighth school in seven years if he had ultimately transferred. That's so this will be the first time that he stays in a system for two years. Well, actually, it's not even staying in a system because they, of course, uh, replaced their, their defensive <laughs> staff. But but, you know, stays in a program for more than one year since uh, since he was in middle school. Well, it's that speaks for his raw talent stuff. that no matter what coach you throw at him, he's apparently just able to, to play. That's the thing. I, I do feel like that's lost a little bit in this discussion. How do you manage to be good everywhere? That is nuts. Like, it's one thing to come in and be in high school and be like, well, I'm going to transfer to a, a high school and have a chance to be good. It is another thing to say, I'm going to show up at Georgia and by the way, be seen as the future of your defensive line, then transfer to USC and be an all Pac-12 player. And, and like, it's it's crazy stuff. So I mean, shout out to his talent. He is, he's a very talented player. That's a big retention for USC. Again, I don't want to derail our whole Alabama conversation over it, but that that surprised me quite a bit because <laughs> it seems pretty clear. Yeah. And, and also, uh, let, let's just be clear. Barry Alexander waited until Wednesday to put out the tweet instead of Tuesday when the news broke because, again, he was – we know it was in negotiations. Oh, yeah. We, we, we know that they, that we were uh, we were going to see what ended up happening. <laughs> but I'm glad for USC. I mean, I, I think that that's a big deal for them, of course. I'm glad for Bear Alexander that he's going to be in one place for two years. Like, I, just to grow as a human being, it's it's a tough thing to do when you're always moving everywhere. Vehicle tracker season. Time to see what he's going to be rolling around with. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's... He's not he's not the first player that I can think of who uh, essentially is threatened to enter the portal so that they get a little bit of a bump in what they're receiving. I, I won't name any names. No, no. Uh, this one was just too this one was just too flagrant and open to be yes. anything else. Yes. Like I'm actually amused at it. But and and here's the interesting question. Just and again, I don't want to derail it, but are we gonna see more guys who are that talented? play that kind of a game because as you said like you kind of pointed out why he could do it like he could put him in any offense a defense pardon me and he's he's phenomenal yeah. as an individual um like so are we going to see some more of the the flashier players who kind of think like you know you need me and anyone will be lucky to have me i think of some receivers i could pull that one off yeah well i i think that one piece of this is uh you mentioned receivers defensive linemen especially interior linemen the two most attractive players in the portal, like everybody right now, I, I put together our story yesterday on Bear Alexander potentially transferring. And uh, you look across college football, basically every program is like, well, we could use an interior defensive lineman. Well, we, we could use an upgrade at that position. And uh, so, you know, the the money that's flowing around at that position, I think is huge. That's a huge part of it. I would be curious uh, whether this is something that he tried to pull with Georgia last year and Georgia called his bluff. And said, no, nah, OK, if, if you say that you're leaving, then leave, because Georgia is one of those programs. They don't they don't need to be waiting around for you to figure out whether you want to be here or not. Uh, and, and so I do think that that's going to be an aspect is 
for the best programs in America, for the you know Georgias, for the Ohio States, the Alabamas, Texas with what they're doing right now, I think that maybe these are the programs that say, if you're going to try to pull this, like, get out. We, we don't need you to, to try and be here. We're not going to do something for you. You're going to do something for us. We've, we've done our part. So it'll be an interesting dynamic. I do think that it's going to derail some of the maybe like, maybe I'd say second tier contenders, right? Like, like, I mean, right now, maybe a program that's in USC's position, one that's trying to maybe move up to that first tier. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I think even, I think of a player, uh, you know, I think of a team like Ole Miss, you know, with with Quinshawn Judkins eventually ending up at Ohio State, that's something that's going to be a risk potentially for somebody who you've developed and has been in your program for two years. I think that that's going to be a threat. But uh, fascinating dynamic. I, I think that that's huge for USC. USC doesn't play their spring game until next week. They're they're in the the Texas group of uh, of teams playing on on April twentieth. But back to Alabama, I do think Alabama's spring game is going to be fascinating just from the perspective of that. I don't think we have any idea what to expect whether it's where guys are going to be on the field whether it's who's playing in what position group whether it's uh you know what young players have stepped up and maybe fit into a Kalen DeBoer system better than they fit into a Nick Saban system it's going to be a completely different ball game in so many ways and you know again we might not get many of these answers during the spring game itself but this is the first look that we're going to see at, a, at an Alabama that's devoid of Nick Saban. And Nick Saban has been very open about the fact that he wants to still be a resource for the University of Alabama, for Kalen DeBoer, as he takes over this program. So I still expect that he's going to be a presence through this first year, at least. But it's a fascinating dynamic. I, I don't necessarily know what to expect. They're probably, you know, them along with Michigan are probably the two programs that I'm most like, who? What's about to happen right now? I don't even know. Absolutely. Um, the mystery is what makes it so intriguing. Well, when we come back, we'll take a look at some of the other teams that seem to be, you know, on that that next level tier of programs that could be contending for a championship that also have spring games coming up this weekend here on the College Football Survivor Show. The College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. So looking at the next group of teams, I mean, these are teams like, as you mentioned, like an Ole Miss um, that are they're playing spring games this upcoming weekend, but are also, you know, I wouldn't say dark horse uh, contenders, but certainly teams with playoff expectations that are realistic. Um, Those include, for example, just kind of run down some of the teams. Well, actually, we can just go to them one by one. LSU is one of the teams that immediately pops to mind because last year, obviously we know the whole story, you know, um, they're basically an upgraded version of USC where it was an interesting offense uh, or talent um, that actually could compete, but then the defense would let them down and they spent a ton of money to bring in um, Mizzou's defensive coordinator, Blake Baker. Can they fix what's there? Um, they've lost two of their guys, uh, Smith and Wingo off the line. So now they've only even got two returning scholarship defensive linemen. What do you make of LSU and what should we look for in that spring game? Yeah, I mentioned Alabama as as being a program that I don't know what to expect. But defensively, I think that LSU is probably right there with them. I I mean, you mentioned bringing Blake Baker, a really, really good defensive coordinator from Missouri, one who uh, was on staff at at LSU, ironically, when Brian Kelly took over. And he was not retained on Brian Kelly's staff whenever he took over that program after he moved from, from Notre Dame. So... Good for him to be back. I, I think that that's a, a great deal for him. And I think that, you know, so much of this depends on whether Harold Perkins has grown on the defensive side of the ball. You know, talent wise, you mentioned, especially on the defensive line, they are not where they need to be. I think that they're a program that ironically could have really used Bear Alexander if he had been available. He obviously uh, will not be transferring now. But Harold Perkins is one of those players who might be able to cover some of those holes if he's able to to continue to grow. Now, the first year of him as a full-time linebacker did not go very well at all. Uh, I will say, Blake Baker is a defensive coordinator who is very smart with the way that he uses linebackers. It's not just in like the traditional sense of like, you know, you you stand up and then you go attack the hole and that's all you do. Like he's going to have, I think all these linebackers coming from different angles. He's going to use them as pass rushers, but not just edge rushers, also rushers up the middle. And so 
I do think that Hale Perkins is going to fit a little better into this system than maybe he did the prior system. But it's still a lot to ask. And, you know, again, especially when you don't have returning production on the defensive line, it puts that much more onus on your linebackers and certainly on a secondary that was really, really bad last year. That was one of the worst in the SEC in a lot of ways. But talent wise, I think they still have a lot to hang their hat on. So defensively, I, I want to see how they're adjusting and I want to see the different ways that they're using uh, linebackers potentially offensively. This is a very different type of offense than what we saw last season, but I don't think that that necessarily means a worse offense. Garrett Nussmeyer, uh, you know, son of the the former Dallas Cowboys quarterbacks coach Doug Nussmeyer, of course, he he played right in my neck of the woods as well because uh, because he was a Dallas kid growing up. I think that he is more of a pocket passer. He's somebody who's going to more be dealing from the pocket. Uh, I think that the comparison is more to a Joe Burrow than to a Jaden Daniels, potentially, in terms of style. Uh, of course, you know, we'll have to kind of wait and see whether they have the receiver talent with Brian Thomas and Malik Neighbors off to the NFL around it. So that would be another piece that I'll be keeping an eye on is that receiver room. Are Kyron Lacey, CJ Daniels, Xavier Thomas, Chris Hilton, are they able to step up and replace him with that production of Malik N- Neighbors and Brian Thomas? Because that was potentially the best duo in college football last season. Absolutely. You know, I want to move us to another team um, out of the SEC, but the Miami Hurricanes, they still, they recruit well. Obviously, the biggest question is, well, the question is more of like, everyone just wants to see Cam Ward um, debut as as their quarterback in their spring game and how they can tailor that offense around him. I mean, he's been a dual threat quarterback. Wazoo made him more of a, of a passer. But when he was incarnate word where he really got the, the college football world, at least the coach's attention, um, he was being used in both ways. He gets to inherit a couple of great receivers with Xavier Restrepo and, and Jacoby George, as well as some good freshmen uh, with Jojo Trader and Nye Carr. But at the same time, the backup quarterback the, is a guy who, as we talked about in a previous show, the star quarterback from Albany, Reese Poffenbarger, is now there. And um, maybe QB number two, maybe looking around after her. We don't know. Um, but it'll be interesting to see. What, what are your thoughts on Miami heading into this spring game? Well, I think that you mentioned Cam Ward, a player that I have a lot of familiarity with. I covered him when he was back at Incarnate Word. I've gotten to talk to people from West Columbia, his hometown, where he was a nobody recruit before Eric Morris kind of plucked him out of nothing. And I think that what I love about him moving on i mean i hate it for washington state i I hate everything right now for washington state and oregon state let's just let's just have that be a blanket statement but i think that in a system with shannon dawson um miami's offensive coordinator he's going to have the opportunity to just do more traditional quarterback things and i think that that fits him really well I, i don't want to compare him to the Patrick Mahomes or Caleb Williams type players, but I think that at his best, that's what he is going to be. It's stylistically, to be clear, not in terms of talent, not, not number one pick in the NFL draft necessarily. But I think that so much of his time at Washington State, they were running air raid stuff, and he was just making stuff happen. He was running around trying to buy time because he played behind a poor offensive line. And you saw that translate into turnovers and interceptions and fumbles and bad decisions. Well, now you've got Miami, a program that has, you know, kind of hangs their hat on offensive line play under Mario Cristobal and a a receiver room that I think should only continue to get better. So is Cam Ward going to be able to rise to that challenge and play more of a pocket type game? Now, again, pocket type game, I don't necessarily mean, you know, being a statue. I mean, in terms of maneuvering in the pocket trying to use your legs as a passer instead of just trying to scramble out of the pocket and getting to the edges. I think that that's the next evolution of his game. If this goes as well as I hope it'll go, there's upside for Cam Ward to be a potential first round pick in next year's draft. He has that kind of talent and that kind of production, by the way, as well. But you know, th- this is kind of in a very different way, the conversation that we had about Sam Hartman last offseason of, you know, can can he adjust to a more pro style system and continue this production? And for Sam Hartman, the answer ended up largely being no. I'm hopeful that Cam Ward, uh, again, 
completely different stylistic players, but I'm hoping that it can be a different answer. Yeah, and I think another just kind of general question, Miami is expected to also look pretty heavily again at the transfer portal come uh, when the spring portal opens. They're expected to look for a running back, which we'll get to in a second, because um, the one that they have is probably leaving um, for his old team. Uh, they may be looking for some more folks um, to be edge rushers, linebackers, defensive backs. Uh, that's something that, of course, the coach there is is very good at. He's been very good at at, uh, at poaching players. I also wonder if, because again, Cam Ward was a late addition for those who may not remember that. Um, that bringing in a player of that marquee can also suddenly make your destination more attractive to other players. So um, it'll be interesting to see if that's added even more flash for those interested in joining Mario Cristobal's program there. But you know, going back off of that running back thing, because obviously Henry Parrish Jr. Um, looks like he may be heading to his old team. And that, of course, is another team having their spring game this weekend, and that's the Ole Miss Rebels. Because uh, the big question there is who's going to be the running back? Quinshawn Judkins' decision to leave was, I think, a surprise for everyone there. I wonder if he just felt unappreciated or really was it a Bear Alexander situation where, again, like, you know, oh, you know, you, you don't believe me? <laughs> you think I'm established here? Well, watch me establish myself in another program. Um, they obviously have Ulysses Bentley back. Um, he's a decent running back as well. Good. Uh, Logan Diggs transferred from LSU, although he's had some injury issues. So that has created some concerns. I know Lane Kiffin has, has been quite open about it. I mean, he's even free, he even straight up called it a free agency window coming up. Um, and, and that's what led to, to Henry Parrish. But in addition to the running back or, or elaborating on the running back situation, what other things are you looking for with Ole Miss? Well, I think that Ole Miss is a program, like you mentioned, that will continue to be active. Uh, I mentioned, of course, hating everything that's happened to Oregon State and Washington State over the last little while. Damian Martinez, the outstanding running back from Oregon State, is potentially a player that I think Ole Miss could go hard after, depending on where he wants to be. There's a lot of program. If he wants to be closer to, to DFW where he's from, that certainly could be a different conversation. But you know, I want to see Ole Miss in their spring game look the part, especially in the trenches. They were incredibly aggressive uh, in the trenches over this portal period, adding one of the most impressive groups that I've really ever seen added through a portal period. Two starters from that Washington offensive line, Julius Bulow, Nate Kalepo coming in, uh, potentially going to be starters for them. On the defensive side of the ball, potentially even better. Walter Nolan was I think he was the number one player or maybe the number one non uh, non quarterback player in the transfer portal, according to two, four, seven. And I mean, that, that'll do, man. They don't make six, four, two, eighty five just anywhere. And he moves like crazy. He is a special, special, special type of player. Uh, Princely Uman Millian also coming in uh, the transfer from Florida. Florida lost a lot of players that they really should not have lost <laughs> to the transfer portal this year. But Princely, I think, has a chance to grow into a first round edge rusher. And that doesn't even get into some of the the more depth pieces along the trench that they added, like Gerquan Scott, potentially a player from Southern Miss who could factor into the rotation. I, I think you also have to love what they added at receiver with Juice Wells coming in. I, I mean, it's just there are so many guys like they I, like Ohio State is another program where you just look at their list of transfers and you're like, wait, all these guys are good. And Ole Miss kind of did that this offseason, too. They didn't just have a quantity of players come in, which they certainly did as well. They uh, Overall, they had 15 transfers, but 10 plus of them were like elite transfers, were game-changing type transfers, including, like I mentioned, those guys in the trenches. So I want to see how those guys fit in. I want to see how their personalities fit in with everything, because I think that integrating transfers, some people think that, you can just plug and play. It's not always that easy necessarily, but like if it's done a good job with it so far. And the other piece too, that I think you want to keep an eye on is uh, especially from a leadership perspective, has Jackson Dart continued to take that step from year one to year two as a starter. I think that Ole Miss uh, and Jackson Dart grew a lot. I, I mean, I think that his second year, especially as a passer, you started to see some things that I wasn't sure that you'd ever see. Uh, and ultimately I think that, if he's able to take that step and Ole Miss is able to put some of that help around him at, on the offensive line, that's how you compete with Alabama and Georgia and Texas and Ohio State. And we'll see if this is the year that Lane Kiffin is able to get it done. 
You know, moving over to their spiritual playoff cousin in the Big Ten, Penn State has their own spring game coming up. Although Penn State's kind of an interesting one. And I'm going to put Utah in this basket too, where we don't really worry that much about their defense. We don't really talk about the defense that much in the spring game because it's just sort of presumed that they're going to just keep rolling. But offense, we've got some interesting stuff that's going to be happening, at least new stuff. And I know you're really excited, obviously, about their new offensive coordinator. What should we look for with Penn State? Yeah, that's the only thing I care about is Andy Kotelnicki. I, I want to see an offense that doesn't look anything like a James Franklin offense. I, I don't I want to watch them play even their most vanilla form in the spring game. And I want to see a team that fundamentally looks like Kansas last year or Buffalo before that or Wisconsin Whitewater before that. I want to see no traces of the James Franklin offense that has existed the past couple of years. You know, Kotal Nicky, for people who don't know, he came up all the way from D3 to D1 with uh, with Lance Leipold, was considered by many to be one of the best offensive minds in the game. And he is a master of misdirection. That's where he's special. Uh, I, I think that, you know, you, you think about what Washington did at times last year with Kalen DeBoer. Kansas did that in some ways to an even greater level with, you know, sort of quote unquote lesser talent. And. I'm going to be curious to see because the one thing that concerns me about what he's going to do and bring to the table is that Drew Aller is a statue in the pocket. He is not somebody who's really made to run to be a mobile player. And whether it's Jalen Daniels or Jason Bean at Kansas, Andy Kotelnicki has made his hay in a lot of ways with mobile quarterbacks. I do think that that's not a requirement to run this kind of offense well, but it does mean that you need to do a good job of creating some misdirection in quick passing game in terms of, uh, you know, running run pass option stuff in terms of running play action stuff. That's going to be a piece that I'm going to be keeping an eye on in the spring game. And just in general, I mean, I, I want to see how do they use Drew Aller and how comfortable is he in executing what they want, whether it is, uh, you know, taking these shots, right? What, whether it is um, even even running maybe some some option stuff. I'll be curious to see if they do some more of that. And and if if Penn State is able to finally kind of break through and not necessarily win the Big Ten, but compete for the Big Ten, that's going to be the difference. Is doing special stuff schematically, and I, I think that until they do that, like <laughs> none of how good they've been really matters until they can do that. Yeah, you know, at the very least, Kotelnicki does have some good tools at his disposal, um, especially as he's, he's relied on the running game, or le- at least leaned a bit on the running game before. So you still have Katron Allen, Nick Singleton, you've got Cam Wallace, and then you have at least another good receiver, at least on paper, coming in with Julian Fleming, the former five-star from Ohio State, um, which will hopefully give another target for uh, for Aller. But it'll be interesting to see how that Penn State offense develops. You know, one other team where, again, their defense is one that we presume that I mentioned earlier is Utah. They are also playing uh, this, this weekend and it's a bit of an injury reset because they lost so many key players, but the, the lead is of course, Cam rising, who was already a banged up player before that, that unfortunate Rose bowl uh, at the beginning of, of 2023 um, missed all of last season. So now there's this race to be the backup quarterback. And, and it, from all accounts, it's been a, a neck and neck race between sophomore Brandon Rose and freshman Isaac Wilson. Um, and it, it, whenever you're neck and neck, it's also it's either like, wow, that's great. They're both good. Or you find out we're hitting the transfer portal because <laughs> they're actually both at a level where we don't want them to be. But, you know, that's TBD. Um, but, yeah, again, running backs, you know, Micah Bernard. Uh, had a season-ending injury against Baylor after two back-to-back 500-plus yard seasons. So he's coming back. They have the guy who sw- who replaced him last season, uh, junior Jalen Glover, stepping back up. They also have a transfer in Anthony Woods, who was – I always have to remind myself Idaho's FCS. That's still a, that still hurts me that they had to drop down. But he was an absolute workhorse for the Vandals. So he's coming in and, and theoretically could could step up. And they also have – um, a redshirt freshman who didn't seem to be great last season. At least they didn't use him at all. Um, but Mike Mitchell, who also seems to have emerged in practice to be a potential running back. And then I'm going to also mention a couple of other injured players. Micah Pittman, who was a two-time transfer, who in the middle of last season, uh, very early on, also uh, suffered concussion against Baylor and was lost for the season. And um, tight end Brant Keithy, who is also returning. So they've got, it's kind of interesting how like so many of their key players that were going to be great last season 
are now coming back again with kind of an injury reset, which, especially with Cam Rising, I mean, I want to see a redemption. Like, not redemption. It's not like he, it was his fault. But I want to see him reach, I mean, rise, sorry, Cam Rising, to, to where, he, where he was seemingly being. But at the same time, you have to acknowledge there's a certain concern that, you know, uh, it, it, when you get that serious of an injury, there's always a potential that it gets reignited and then you, you miss another season. So that backup quarterback race is seems to be more relevant than most of the other teams out there. No, I, I think that backup quarterback might be the race that I'm watching most out of any of these Utah position battles. Because, look, if Cameron Rising stays healthy, then I think that Utah is the favorite in the Big 12. And likely should be in the college football playoff this upcoming season defensively like you mentioned they're just a program that you yeah. assume we're, we're gonna figure it out they're gonna have new safeties come in and it's gonna it's gonna work <laughs> great it just all it always seems to work great uh for whenever you're that program um you know offensively they actually made some key additions as well uh to kind of help fortify the non-quarterback position groups you know i really like uh, the fact that they added a couple transfers at the wide receiver position, for example, just in order to to just give their offense a few more weapons. Uh, you know, I, I think that Dorian Singer certainly has to be chief among them, mm-hmm. a, a former star at Arizona who was just never able to to kind of find his moment during his time at USC, but will be a huge addition for Utah. So, like, again, it's just what happens. What what happens if Cameron Rising gets hurt? Like, is it just over? Is, is, is it just are, is, are they just in big trouble if that ends up happening? Because that's what it feels like. They've got uh, Luke Batari, who is somebody who's played a little bit for them over the past year or two, but not not very well. I, I don't think that anybody was all that excited when Luke Batari <laughs> got into the game. They brought in a transfer uh, from the junior college ranks in McLeod Croton. That's a hell of a name, uh, but of course, a name from a of, of a Utah. Uh, and then also Brandon Rhodes is another player who actually showed a little bit last season, but only a sophomore right now. Mm-hmm. Not not somebody that I think you want to be relying on a whole lot if you're Utah. A piece that I'm also going to be watching with this, not just at the spring game, but beyond is does the staff feel comfortable potentially coming in? If uh, if d- do they decide that they need to add more help depth wise at the quarterback position coming out of spring? I mean, that would be uh, certainly a concerning aspect if they don't feel like they have their guy on campus. And another guy also to mention, by the way, they brought in a really good freshman, Isaac Wilson, uh, who was a blue chip recruit coming out of high school from Draper, Utah. But again, similar sort of deal. Do you trust them to to be ready? Do you trust Isaac Wilson to be ready to, to play major snaps right away? So this position group and this injury situation was the reason that Utah did not contend for the Pac-12 last year. Straight up. Mm-hmm. Bryson Barnes did a great job. He fought his butt off, but he was not ready for this moment. He did not have the upside that they needed at the position. So ultimately... What ends up happening with this backup quarterback situation, I think, sets the floor in a lot of ways for what Utah can be this season. So rounding out this this tier of teams that are playoff contenders, if not the the top, top level playoff contenders, certainly credible playoff contenders, we have the Tennessee Volunteers. And Vols fans everywhere were excited uh, in that bowl game because they finally got to see Nico Ia. Maleava. Um, I will get faster at this as time goes on. Please forgive me. It's always ironic when your name is Bobak Hayeri, and then you know somebody else with a name that's a little more complicated. Kind of like, hi, I grew up in. Ba-. That's that's what I almost rely on. Like, hey, I grew up in Bakersfield. You know, like uh, <laughs> kind of rely on that. But um, there's a lot of things to look for. I know the secondary is going to be an interesting question because all five starters from that unit are gone. Um, They're either going to the NFL or the transfer portal. So, and then several of their key backups decided to take their talents elsewhere. Um, Again, they got an Oregon state cornerback in uh, Jermad McCoy, as, as much as, as we said, we're sad to see what's been happening over at the, the pack two remnants. They've got someone from middle Tennessee. So it looks like they have people who could be upgrades at that position. Um, But what are you looking for heading into the vol spring day? 
Yeah, I mean, you mentioned it, of course, a, a really interesting uh, offense coming back. I think that a big question for me is, do they feel like they've replaced the pieces on defense? Because if they have, like, I think that this offense is going to have a chance to be ready to go. Uh, I, I do want to see, of course, how Nico looks in his first or I guess second true start since he did play, of course, in uh, in the bowl game and, and looked pretty good doing that. Yeah, the other thing, too, is, you know, they're, they're having to replace Jalen Wright at running back. That's another position group that I think could maybe have a competition with Dylan Sampson, Cameron Selden potentially getting into that lineup. But, you know, overall, I, I just want to see them continue to grow under center and in that passing game. I don't expect them to throw very many bombs to show off uh, in this spring game, certainly. You know, you want to keep your your players healthy and you don't want to give too much away. But uh, I do think that this is an opportunity to continue to grow that passing game and grow Nico's confidence under the lights of, uh, of Neyland Stadium. And I think that that's going to be a huge priority heading into this upcoming year. But again, on the on the defensive side of the ball, integrating some of those transfers, integrating some of those new pieces, growing some players up. Uh, you know, again, th- th- this is a team that it doesn't feel like needs a lot to go right to take a big step next year. But we'll kind of have to see what early returns are. You know, as we, uh, I don't want to quite wrap this up just yet because I want to see like, are there other just teams worth noting? Because obviously there's some other teams with, it may not be, Premier playoff contenders, but have interesting storylines. Obviously, Arkansas, we're going to see how Bobby Petrino comes in. Um, if Chip Kelly was in at Ohio State, he'd by far be probably the more int- – I'd even rank him above uh, Col- uh, Colton Necky in terms of guys. I'm just kind of like curious to see how that's going to go because um, of all that drama. Obviously, Houston's that's got – a nice way to put it. Yeah. Houston's got Willie Fritz coming. You know, will the Florida Gators – You know, what does Billy Napier show at spring day? I mean, when we're kind of wondering how that's going to go. Um, gosh, you could go with, you know, heck BC. I'm kind of curious about Bill O'Brien, but I think maybe that one's a little bit of a stretch, but Kentucky's another one too. I mean, transfer quarterbacks for them, you know, Will Levis didn't quite work the way they thought it was going to Devin Leary didn't quite work the way it was. They thought it was going to do. And this season's model is of course, uh, Brock Vandegrift from Georgia. So we'll see how Kentucky makes it work with him. Um, but kind of just of these other spring games. And I just say one more Boise state only because it's fascinating. Cause you got Dirk Cotter who's back there as our offensive coordinator, former head coach who went on to Arizona state and has, has helped out in various questions. You have the QB transfer from USC and Malachi Nelson, who, uh, who was a five-star quarterback, who was exceptionally talented, had some injury issues. And then you have underside Maddox and Madsen who had stepped up to be a quarterback there as well. You have a, Interesting wide receiver transfer from Chuko, Chris Marshall, who had um, who had some issues at that Texas A&M spot. He's had a time, man. He's Mitch had a time. A hot minute, and then kind of ended up the Juco ranks. So Boise State's is kind of entertaining because when you look at the, the names involved, you're like, huh, that's where they are now uh, kind of situation. And with the fact that Broncos always seem to be, you have to consider them as always a potential G5 contender for getting into the playoff. But of these teams, what are uh, any of them seem interesting to you? And have any of them or uh, additional teams got your attention as spring game contenders this particular weekend? I can't believe you're not mentioning the top college football playoff contender from the group, UTSA, playing at 3 p.m. this weekend. Uh, their game is not televised, which actually kind of sucks. It I, does I suck. would like to have a chance. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a chance to to see their spring game. And I do legitimately think they might be among the top contenders for, uh, for the group of five spot in the college football playoff this year. You know, another team that I will mention uh, is Virginia Tech. I think that they are a dark horse type contender in the ACC. Like, let's just say that Florida State takes a step back. I mean, Virginia Tech, once they turned to Chiron Drones, was a completely different type of team. So I'll, I'll be fascinated to see what ends up happening there. You know, another team that I will also mention is Houston. First year under a new coach uh, in Willie Fritz. It's going to be different. And, you know, I, I've talked to some people who are super optimistic about what this team has a chance to be. It doesn't always happen in year one with Willie Fritz because it's a it's a completely new system. It's a completely new way of playing football. You know, just the philosophy of it is different. So I, I don't necessarily know that we're going to learn 
a whole lot from uh, from the spring game specifically. But I will be curious to kind of see what they end up doing at the quarterback position. They bring in uh, Zion Chris, I believe, from Jacksonville State. Donovan Smith is back uh, as, of course, uh, the incumbent starter. Do they feel like one of those two players fits this offense better than the other? I, I don't necessarily know. Both of them have experience as dual threat quarterbacks. So I, I think that either can probably run it to a high level. And the other pieces, you know, Houston, <laughs> I, I made the joke last year, the final year, I guess, of the Dana Holgerson era, that they were just like, what if we tried to build an entire team out of wide receivers and nothing else? Well, they have some good wide receivers on this roster, man. Uh, Joseph Manjack, a former USC transfer. Makai Muse coming in from Georgia. Uh, Sam Brown, Josh Cobbs, Stephon Johnson. Like uh, They got some good players at the wide receiver position. How are they able to leverage those players in an offense that uh, certainly when you look back at Tulane or Sam Houston before or Georgia Southern, I, I mean, they like to do a lot of run option type stuff. How do they leverage these receivers in a way that maximizes what they have on campus? Willie Fritz is a very smart football coach, so I expect that he's going to figure out. But it is a it's a different kind of challenge. And again, I, I put them in the category uh, of almost like the Alabama, like, hey, I don't even know what I'm going to see this weekend. And so <laughs> I'm excited. I love that comment about a whole team of wide receivers, because one of the thoughts I had just wouldn't it be funny if Chip Kelly for the first play put all five quarterbacks out there and just had them in the backfield <laughs> and just started having them lateral to each other constantly. Uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you what I uh, we saw it actually one or two times from Andy Kotelnicki that he ran Jalen Daniels and Jason Bean onto the field at Kansas. Uh, we also saw it with uh, Stanford coach Troy Taylor, especially when he was at Sacramento State. He would run two quarterback lineups. To me, that is the next great evolution of football is when we have two true passers on the field. I think that that should be something that, that coaches should be working on already. They should be trying to scheme it up, whether it's it's getting the ball out to guys through laterals, whether it's lining guys up at running back. I mean, a good example of this, I, I think he ended up transferring is like Jaquindon Jackson at Utah was a former big time quarterback recruit. Make it happen, y'all. Make it happen. I, I want to see more two quarterback lineups on the field. Oh, my goodness. And now I think of the late, great J Jared Lawrenson. Imagine having him line up in the offensive line <laughs> and then pop out and throw a deep bomb. Oh, my goodness. Oh, well, <laughs> I love it. Well, I think this is a good spot to kind of wrap. This has been a dense show. We've gone through a lot of teams, and there's a lot of games coming up this weekend of interest. Um I wanted to take a second to thank all of you for listening. Hopefully you get to see some of these spring games, maybe in person or on TV. I wanted to thank our producer, Joey Alliberti, for making us uh, sound good and edit us when we need it. Uh, be sure if you get a chance to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Find us on X and TikTok at CFB Survivor Show. Um, he's Shahan J. Raja. You can find his work at CBSSports.com and at Shahan J. Raja on X and TikTok. I'm Bob Ekayeri. Have a great week, everyone. The College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line.